night. And so we started the funeral. We she didn't even, her casket didn't even come in until five minutes late. Oh, <laughs> uh, that she would always come yeah. in late at her Bible study on Wednesday uh -huh. night. And everybody knew it. I mean just there and so we we oh. everybody's there waiting. We started right on time, but she we had to wait for it. And That's it. They, a long time ago. They kept brought her in five minutes late yeah. for their own funeral. Right. It was a long five minutes. <laughs> we're gonna we're, yeah, I'm yeah, watching them back in the back. We're gonna wait. <laughs> That we're going to do, you know, yeah. what we're going to do. And she said, oh, please do. Please do. Promise me you will. I will. And we did. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given, to gather, given us together together in this your place, the place of our heart. We thank you for this home. But we thank you, Father, that you're doing something in our heart that only you can do. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. We simply ask that you do what only you can do. Open the eyes of understanding. Bring to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of your role in our life, what Jesus really has done mm -hmm. to freely do for us at Calvary to fulfill the eternal plan of Father God that you had since before the world was created. Be our teacher, be our guide. Help us repent. Help us repent. May we change our mind when it doesn't line up with your wisdom and your logic. May we change our mind to fit your wisdom and your logic. May your word be supreme. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and amen. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for being here. I feel like an old man rocking in a chair. <laughs> That's not good at all. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to uh, g give a... Uh, uh, not a warning, but a disclaimer. Uh, we 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 usually operate in situations like this in the position of uh, of a teacher. But a uh, job of a teacher isn't to convince you what we know is right. So that's not my job. I'm not trying to sway anybody in any way or anything. My job as a teacher is to make you think about what you believe. So the great teacher, the Holy Spirit, can then do. Most people don't think. About we just hear and we believe. We're not thinking about the scriptures. We're not, you know, we're not putting it in context. And one of the things we do in our ministry is we try to bring the the Jewish culture back into scripture. That you know it hasn't been taken out on purpose, but Americans don't know anything about the Jewish culture. It's a rare thing for people to really understand. You know, for for, for example, does everybody know the uh, the teaching that Jesus said if someone slaps you? Uh, on your the right cheek to turn the other cheek. Everybody knows that story. You've heard it. You've heard it preached probably. Me, but has, have you ever heard it in context? And what do I mean by context? Well, if you have context and you take the text out of the context, what are you left with? So if we don't know the context the scripture is written in, and we just have the text without the context, we we're understanding a con. But that whole the whole teaching that Jesus was doing there. In the in the Middle Eastern culture, just not in Israel, not just not, not to a Hebrew, but throughout the culture, you know, if I was to slap Jay, I'm not going to, but if I was to slap Jay on his right cheek, what hand would I have to use standing in front of him? Left. I'd have to use my left hand. Well, the left hand in, in that culture is the poop hand. It's an insult of character to touch anybody with the left hand. That's why they're, they're all, when they eat, they like the Passover meal, they're leaning on their left hand. They don't use it to pass food. Mm. Mm. And see, it's, it's stuff like that that makes the Scripture, oh, this is the... So, so Jesus wasn't say, saying, stand there and take, a, take the high road and take another lick for Jesus. You know? No. But we, I've heard that taught. Mm -hmm. No, it's just like... In other words, what it's saying is that if there's a conflict, obviously there's a conflict if someone slaps you. So that's a sign of conflict. You know, back in the olden days, it would be called a duel. You know? <laughs> you know? But it's a conflict. It's a, as long as someone feels that if they touch you with their left hand, that's them saying that you are as dumb to them, that you're lower. Mm -hmm. You're lower class. You're lower case. And you'll never solve an issue. You'll never deal with an issue as long as someone feels like they're better than you. So you stand there until they slap you with their right hand. That means you're equal. You still have an issue to deal with, but you can deal with it now on, hey, 
you're as valuable as I am. But until someone, if someone's always thinking they're more valuable, the issue will never be really resolved. And so it's things like that when you get into the Jewish idioms and the, the climate. You know, we, we've been on a thing recently for Christmas, and I got, Joy, don't let me keep going on this. But well, wait, wait, before you go, did you want to say anything about this? Yeah, I didn't think I was going yet. I guess, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, these are uh, flash drives. Flash drives. So, uh, these are, they're in the shape of a business uh, credit card, but there's a little flash drive here. And it's got, uh, if you're curious and want to know more about, this was done several years ago, but a friend of mine and I, we did eight hours of teaching on a Saturday. We used to go around to different places and do one Saturday, eight hours. He'd do 25 minutes. We'd take a five-minute break. I'd do 25 minutes. And we do that for eight hours. And it's, it's, this is actually an audio video, and it's that teaching. And uh, if you want one, you can have one. Anyway. We don't march nice, very good. Uh, where was I at? Um, you were going to talk about Christmas, but you didn't oh, yeah, go, about the, go uh, very long on that. Yeah, about you know the, the 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 nativity story that we have heard for years is so wrong. Mm -hmm. It just really is. And if we, once you understand the culture and the climate, the idioms, uh, really what it meant. And, and for for instance, <clears throat> there's a there's a passage of scripture that says, "And in those days." Now, we read right past that. But that's just like, you know, we take it like, well, once upon a time. You know, know. You know it's just, a, but it's a time stamp. It's what is known as a time stamp. You need to know what was going on in... Yes, it was Because if you don't know what was going on in those days, you won't know what they had to deal with to stand... I mean, and so, in those days... And so we did the whole series just on the history... That was taking place with the the, the the Roman Caesars and the the generals and the persecutions and the, uh, all the stuff that was going on in those days. Because when you understand the context of this, it will change the way you see this. And so that's what we try to do in our teachings. And again, <clears throat> we're not trying to convince you that we we're. I just want to make you think about what you believe. That's our goal. And if today is uh, Saturday evening, I think it's Saturday evening, and uh, if next Wednesday you're going, did he really say that? I did my job. If you're still thinking about something we talked about tonight that really hurts you, and my goal is to hurt you bad. <laughs> I will say some stuff probably, you know, if you've been in church for any length of time, I'll say some stuff that you're going to say, well, that guy hurt too. I want you to think that. I want you to have to go that far with what you believe and then have the Holy Spirit just check it. Is it really what the Word says? And uh, But we stick to the Word. A lot of the information we share a lot of times uh, comes out of what is known as the Talmud and the Mishnah. Has anybody ever heard of the Talmud and the Mishnah? The Midrash? Okay, thank you. There's, there's lots of information. That, those aren't inspired writings. Uh, but anything, I believe, anything that adds to, that doesn't contradict the inspired Word of God, that adds to the understanding of the Word of God, is a good source of information. All right? So, so anyway, uh, I, I know this is going to sound strange, but we, we call these freedom fellowships. And uh, we usually open it up for questions. If you have a, a question that you're going, well, I've never heard anybody talk about this, I don't quite understand this, or why, don't ask me if the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl, we won't do that. That's not the kind of questions we're talking about. I'm not prophetic. <laughs> Answer's no. No, you ain't. <laughs> that's good. I even in Minnesota, I pick on the Vikings, and that's a definite no. At least the Cowboys got a chance. But, uh, so if, if there's any question, we, we you know, just... just I know you don't know him. Does this guy know what he's talking about? No, I don't. You know, I'll make it up if I have a good answer. But anyway, just uh, this is what we do. Joy and I, we travel all over uh, doing home fellowships. We've pastored churches all over, and uh, we prefer this setting more than what I call churchdom. Uh, churchdom, Jesus came to establish kingdom. Mm hmm but America has called, created something called churchdom. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, it's what we got. Well, it's not what we need to have. 
you know, and uh, and so I believe this is really the, I mean, there's good things about the corporate large, I mean, corporate churches, and yes, but this is this is where, you know, how many people I've met that have had asked questions that they couldn't ask a church. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this is something I I would encourage. Uh, you, everyone to do in their own Bible understanding. Uh, one of the problems we have in America is we love we love our standards. We have a standard of information, and we hold it dear and true. But there's another standard of information you can get out of the same book, and we hold it dear and true. And this standard is contrary to this standard, and. We, our denominations fight over, you know, you have this, the, the subject of Arminianism and Calvinism. Mm -hmm. Which one is it? This standard, <coughs> or is it this standard? And if you don't know what those are, that's a different, there's mm -hmm. those philosophies of thought when you study. And if you believe this way, you're going to see certain things about Israel. Mm -hmm. And if you believe this way, like dispensationalism, mm -hmm. dispensationalism will cause you to see Israel that uh, uh, is what is known as uh, uh, replacement theology. Mm -hmm. And if you see it in another way, you'll see it's not replacement theology, but the church really isn't even an issue. And one of the things that we've seen in our life, and this has helped us tremendously, it's not this. And it's not this. It's both. It's a blending of both. It's not. Let, let, let me do it this way. Is Jesus the lion? Yes. Is he the lamb? Yes. Yes. Which one is he? Uh -huh. He's and. Everything in between. In, in, in an yeah. old-timey light bulb called filaments. You know, they had to, you know, they don't have to sell those anymore, I don't think. But they, you'd had a, a standard over here, a positive pole and a negative pole. And the electricity went, and the, the light didn't come from this pole, and it didn't come from this pole. It came from the interaction between the two. And that's what truth is. Truth isn't this standard. Because as much as you can show me about... We talk in time eschatology all the time. And as much as you can show me what you believe over here, I can, on purpose, be a little sliver and thorn in your flesh, and I can bring up the other side over here. Mm -hmm. And if you come up and bring that one up, I'm going to be a sliver in your flesh over here on this side just to make you think that... See, there, there's only five things in my opinion that are... When you say, I believe, you say, what do I believe? Knowing the... Imagine, what, what does the word mean that you're talking about? It may not mean the same to someone else's. That's, that's being communicated. But when someone says, what do I believe? I believe Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for all man's sin, resurrected from the grave on the third day, sits at the right hand of the Father. Amen. I, Amen. I believe that. Amen. Everything else is subject for conversation. And I believe that's how the church grows and matures. Instead of raising up a standard and fighting against this over here and... That to answer your question, depending on how a person believes in dispensationalism or how they've studied the Bible over the years, some people have what they call replacement theology, where the church has replaced Israel in Scripture, and they can make a case for that. Okay, And then some people believe that Israel is God's chosen people, and it is, and that there's a future prophecies for Israel in the millennial reign. And there is. So which one is it? It's both. But see, Jesus taught the kingdom of heaven two ways, or one way. But with, see, the kingdom of heaven, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy what? Kingdom. kingdom. So, so where, where's the kingdom at when he's praying? At that time he's praying, it's in heaven. Well, what kingdom is he actually talking? He's not talking about going to heaven. He's talking about that kingdom that's in heaven coming to earth one day in the millennial reign. But what did Jesus say in his teachings, in, in his teachings of Jesus? Jesus said himself, it's not eating or drinking, it's not in the physical realm right now. It's on the inside. And that's why we gave out the most of the people here have the little the bookmarkers. But on one side you'll see three circles. You'll see three circles, and that's, that's called a trichotomy. Uh, some people believe in what is known as a bichotomy, but we, we understand our, the way we're made up is a trichotomy. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. And there are three different but connected parts of our system. 
when, when man was created, God took his spirit and breathed into the clay. The spirit, this is breath, the pneuma. He, he breathed into the clay, the body, and man became something he hadn't won before. That's a living nephes, a living soul. And so you have spirit, soul, and body. And you'll find out that throughout Scripture, everything is done in threes. There's, it's established in the Spirit. In the third John, it says that I pray that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, or according to your soul. See, the faith movement, which I believe in faith, but I don't believe you can bypass your soul. A lot of times people just take the truth of the Spirit, yeah, and they cram it into the flesh, and, well, well, this would have happened if you would have had more of this. Mm -hmm. Well, we bypass the heart. We, we bypass the soul, the mm -hmm. thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, and the will. Like the word salvation. I'll try to get back to your, your question here in a second. But uh, the word salvation is a perfect tense word. You know what a perfect tense word is? In Greek, uh, in English, we have past tense, present tense, and then we have future, future tense. And in the Greek, they have what is known as a perfect tense. It's past, present, and future. Salvation, if I don't even like to say the word salvation, but I'm going to use it because that's what we're used to. Salvation is a perfect tense word. You were saved. Does everybody remember the day? I mean, you, you made a confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were saved. But guess what? The scripture in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, says that Jesus is coming back not for sin, but to bring salvation. I thought we had it. No, he's bringing it. See, there's, in Romans chapter 8, it says the fullness of salvation is you getting your glorified body. I guarantee you, you don't have that yet. No. Look at Charles. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. You know what I'm saying? Does. Yeah, Lord does. Uh, well, no, she doesn't. Not yet. Listen, and so salvation is a, a full. You were saved. The scripture says in James, or even Paul says, Hebrews 10.39 uh, says, we are not of those who draw back to destruction, but press on to the saving of our soul. Now, I was raised in a denomination that taught me that when I got saved, my soul got saved. You know, and, and I that was a, a, a denomination that believed in a bichotomy where the soul and the spirit are the same. You know, that it's they're interlinked. Well, they're interlinked, but they're still separate. They're, they're different, but they're still interlinked. And that's what we're trying to show on the card is that where, where they're joined together, where the spirit and soul are joined together, is literally what the scripture refers to as your heart. <clears throat> Jesus came to heal the broken hearted. hearted. He didn't. And here's one of those statements I know you're going to go, oh. <laughs> He didn't come to stop people from sinning. <laughs> mm -hmm. The gospel is not about making bad people good. That's what I was saying. It's about bringing life to dead people. Amen to that. It's not about living in a, a, a life in a way that you can go to heaven someday. It's about knowing that you're part of your is the seated the right hand of the Father and you're bringing heaven to hell on earth. Yes. That's our mission. It's not to get out of here. It's to bring heaven to those situations where there's hell on earth. And so I'm not trying to... But the issue... See, I believe that there is a place for Israel in the future. I believe the church, or I understand scripture that that now we're the during the dispensation of what is called grace from Calvary to the end of the dispensation of grace is the church age. We're the spiritual Israel. We haven't replaced Israel. God still has a plan for it, but right now we're in the church age called the dispensation of grace. Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 talks about that. And anytime you have questions like this, we can stop and read the verses if you want to but I'm sure most everybody here. So I don't believe in a replacement theology, but Jesus came to establish his bride. Does everybody know what the bride of Christ, we're the bride of Christ? Mm -hmm. Well, most people don't realize that Israel was God, is God's bride. There's two brides in Scripture. God buried Israel in Exodus, started in Exodus <laughs> chapter 6, the, the ten statement ketubah, Notice I didn't say commandments. Because Jewish people don't see it as commandments. It's a ketubah. It's a marriage ceremony. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a testimony of this is, this is, it's a vow. And it starts in Exodus chapter 6 and goes through And there's five stages of their engagement or their betrothal. the betrothal ceremony. And that's where Israel gets their customs 
for marriage is from Exodus, starting in Exodus chapter 6. Of, of, and, and it's just it's where God was right. marrying, committing himself to Israel. You, you ever heard the scriptures where God divorced Israel? How I can you divorce? So. How, I, so long ago. I can't remember where it was, but yes. Yeah, but how, how, how can you divorce someone you're not married to? Mm -hmm. See, God married Israel. They were his special people. They were the apple of God's eye. We're not. We're the bride of Christ. Man, we, this gets in some stuff, and I, we got so much stuff to talk about, but this is the kind of stuff that just lights me up because most people don't see this. Uh, if, if you don't mind, turn your, if you have your Bibles, turn to, uh, turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Roman, Joy's going to put it on the board. If you don't trust what I've got to say, it's going to flash up here sooner or later. Can I just say one thing before you get into all this? It's really... Sometimes we make arguments this um, Arminianism, Calvin, you know, Calvinism, all this, it's really more important to the Father that yeah. our hearts are righteous That's right. than that we are right. That's right. He is much more concerned about us having a righteous life, a righteous thought, righteous response, rather than, well, I'm right. Yeah, we, need to, right. we need to realize, and now I love the Jewish culture. Uh, when I was in Bible school, they, I felt that I was being forced to love Israel. Okay, uh, I I don't. Okay, I I felt I, I was being. She does. I mean, you don't have to agree. I mean, but uh, but I felt I was being forced. And I'm the kind of person if you force it, it ain't gonna work. You know what I'm saying? I just I don't know if that's a spirit of rebellion or what. But yeah, I'd rather be I'd rather my heart not just be told what to do, but my heart be in it. And but uh, we need to understand that uh, God's heart is for Israel. But in Luke chapter 19. Are we going to Luke 19 now? No. You're just going to leave where you're at. In Luke chapter 19, on the triumphal entry. Does everybody know the triumphal entry? Mm -hmm. Okay. It was really wasn't a triumphal entry. Jesus wept because they didn't realize, they didn't recognize the day of their salvation. They didn't recognize that Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy to the day, to the moment. They knew it, but they denied the Messiah on that day. And Jesus himself said, their eyes will be blinded from this day forward. And that's why the Jews, the Jewish people, they're all, they've always been persecuted. They don't see the Messiah. We do. We see their Messiah. We'll probably get into that. So, and we have scripture. I shouldn't say scripture for that, but... They're going to, they're blinded. Yes. Now, as a as a nation, and you need to realize. Now, I'm saying this. Don't don't get up and walk out. The Jewish religion is anti Jesus. Yes, they are. Okay. They're not anti Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. The old Christ means anointed one. It means Messiah. They're looking for their Messiah. We understand he's already here. Yes. Okay, but there, if you go to Jerusalem right now and try to convert someone to Christianity that's under 18, you go to jail. Mm -hmm. They're right. anti Jesus Messiah. Yeah. Right. Okay, they're not anti Christ. So don't think I'm saying that. But I'm making it clear that Jesus said their eyes corporately will be blinded from the truth. And that's why the church age developed to so the spiritual Israel the bride of Christ could be manifest. Now, individual Jews can be saved. They can hear the plan, the good news, the plan of redemption, and they can accept Jesus, and they can stay being Jewish. They can stay the customs and the feasts. We love the customs and the feasts. We learn so much through all that. But never think that what you do makes you righteous before God. <laughs> See, I don't care if you're a cowboy church. I don't care if you're a Catholic. If you believe, if you believe those five things, we can fellowship. We can be in agreement. The rest of it's just a lifestyle, whether you're Baptist or Lutheran or, you know, if you believe those five things. But some people believe their religion is what makes them right with God. Yeah. That their lifestyle makes them right with God. Nothing you can do, here's one of those stretchers, nothing you can do can make you right with God. Real, real simple question. Can you do anything to make your now? This is this is the way truth works, and this is hard. For, <laughs> this is hard for so many people, and I love it. Come on, get them. No, can you do anything in your life to make yourself more accepted to God than what Jesus has done for you? No. 
You can't, can you? Truth works both ways. Let me ask you this question. Can you do anything to make you less righteous before God? Da! Everybody wants to say, well, sure. Listen, it's not based on you either direction. Mm -hmm. Wow. Didn't they ask, um, what must, must we do to inherit the kingdom of God? <coughs> what works must we do? And Jesus said, there's one work, and that's to believe on the Father who sent me. So that's the only thing that we do is to believe on the Father that sent him. And true, true. Is that a true safe? To say? It's not a work, though. No, it's not a work. Right. But that's the only part we play in it. That's right. To believe. God has reconciled the whole world. According to the Book of Corinthians, God's reconciled the whole world to Himself. Now we <clears throat> have to be reconciled to Him. Yeah. Is it God's will that all men be saved? Yes. yes. Say yes. yes. Or all yes. men are going to be saved? No. no. Why? Some won't believe. Right. Turn to believe. And that, that, that is the same principle throughout all the promises in Scripture. The promises are yes and what? Amen. Amen. In Christ. In Christ. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Everybody knows what that says about the, yeah. the, the promises, Blessing. right? Yeah. Have you read Deuteronomy chapter 27? Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 27 are the curses. Mm -hmm. And real interesting, we'll try to get back to that verse, Joyce. I'm not sitting here. I know. I thought it was uh, the blessings 1 through 14 on 28, and then 15 through 64 was the curses. Now, in every one of those, there's 13. 27 is also a curses. Before they do the blessings, yeah. they do the curses. Okay. Yeah, 27, 27 is the curses. And there's, I, I believe there's 13 times where it says, if a man does this, they're cursed. And everybody says, Amen. You know what the word Amen means? Be it unto me. Right. They receive it. They, they, they accept that. Every one of the curses, they all say, Amen. Amen. When it gets to the blessings, not once do they say, Be it unto me. Why? Because the promises of God or yes and amen, amen in Christ. Right. They couldn't say it yet. Because yeah. wow. He was the fulfillment of the promises. It's because of Him. It's not because of what we do. It's because of Him. Mm -hmm. This is foundational. This is, this is having faith in not what you do or don't do. It's getting you... The truest thing about you is what God says about you. Not what your past says about you. Not what your sin life says about you. What does God say about you? In the Spirit, what we're talking about tonight a lot of times is what's called spiritual truth realities. Here's what God's done. This is the way God sees us in the Spirit. This is how we see ourselves in the flesh. It doesn't match up. The problem is we don't know what we know in our soul. Every action we produce, and this is on the card, every action we produce comes from a, a, a thought that you've had. The thoughts produce a feelings, the feelings produce an emotion, the emotions produce an action, and you go to jail for the bad ones. <laughs> so if you can stop the thoughts, and the only way for you to stop those bad thoughts, because every thought you have comes from a belief system that's in your heart. That's why Jesus came to heal the broken. Right. It's a heart issue, not a sin issue. Right. You can get people to stop stop their actions, but if you haven't stopped their heart, they'll still want those actions. They'll come back. It's a heart. The, the gospel is a heart issue. Bringing life to dead people. I believe with all my heart that Jesus knew that if he would ever get into people's hearts, he'd have their life. Now, why do some people not live that way? Because Jesus is just in their head. It's informational salvation. It's not revelational salvation. Revelation. Righteousness has to be revealed inside of us. For it to be real to us. So anyway, uh, I was just saying a lot in all that, but uh, I believe there's a place for Israel. But I believe during this time we're in, it's the church that's spiritual Israel, and there's still a fulfillment for Israel in the future. But right now, Jesus himself said their eyes will be blinded as a nation. They won't see Messiah until the end of the tribulation. 
when the Messiah will be revealed and they'll they'll cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that at that time, he will be the, become, and that's when the millennial reign, if you believe in a millennial reign, that's when the millennial reign will start. And so if you believe you're going to go to heaven, if you die and leave this earth before any type of end times prophecies come to, like the millennial reign comes to pass, you're going to go to heaven, but you're coming back. You're coming back to rule and reign on earth as the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. Heaven is not your final home. Hell, how many people have been told that you're going to, uh, some people are going to hell for all eternity? They're not reading their Bible. Hell's a county jail. All that's in hell is the spirit and the soul. There's one day when those people that are in hell, that hell will give up its dead, and they will join their physical bodies, and they'll be cast into the lake of fire. That's the, the federal prison for all eternity. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to. You know, that this is, hell's just a temporary location until the great white throne of judgment, which is mentioned in the book at the end of the book of Revelation. And then you're going to be joined spirit, soul, and everything's in three parts, people. It says something about the garnishing of teeth. We can imagine. Yeah. Well, okay. We we, we got to get back to this one bird. Are you going to this? No, yeah, I'm going to. Hopefully, will you tell well, me. And, and, and also, you know, when he said that they're gonna, there, there's going to be a lot of Jews saved at the end of the tribulation. Actually, a lot of the tribulation, the purpose of a lot of the tribulation is to get the Jews' attention. That's the there's purpose gonna of the tribulation. There's a lot of Jewish people saved during the tribulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a big revival during the yeah. tribulation. So, but we won't go any further in eschatology, please. We don't want to go any further. But you, you want me to say something about the weeping and gnashing of teeth is that Jesus spoke 18 times the word hell. And out of those 18 times, 15, 15 of those times that he spoke, he was speaking of the Valley of Gehenna. Uh -huh. The Valley of Gehenna is just the outside of Jerusalem. It's a valley there. And it used to be the garbage dump. The reason it was the garbage dump, a little bit of culture and history, is that's where in the Old Testament you hear a story about the Jewish people. Uh, they weren't sacrificing their children to Moloch, but they were dedicating their children to Moloch. And Moloch was a god. It was actually a, a metal structure that they built a fire in, and it was all hollow on the inside. And the hands were, you can look it up on the internet. You can find pictures of it. It's there. And they would, uh, so, and so the tips of the fingers were cut off so the heat could come out. And the eyes were open so the heat could come out. And the ears were open so the smoke could come out. And they built a fire in there, and they put their babies uh, on, in the hands of Moloch. And the idea was to brand them or dedicate them. Some would die. And to, to Moloch, and this is the children of Israel. Well, that's a scar. I mean, that's a bad point of history. And this was done in this valley of Gehenna. And the only way to get rid of that culture, that, that stigma, this bad thing, they turned this, this uh, uh, valley of Gehenna into the garbage dump. Well, the garbage dump is to the west of Jerusalem. Valley of Gehenna is on the west side of Jerusalem. And to the west of that, you have the Sea of Gal I mean, you have the, the Mediterranean Sea, right? And you have the trade winds always coming from the Mediterranean Sea through over the top of the Valley of Gehenna, over the top of Jerusalem, and this is a garbage dump. What did they put in the garbage dump? All their garbage, and anybody that could not afford a tomb, that's where the bodies would go. Does it, I mean, does it, so we need to understand this. That this was a place, just not for garbage, but it's a place for poor people to be buried. And so what do you have when you have a bunch of food garbage in this garbage dump and you have rotten bodies and decaying bodies, what do you have? You have stench. You have wild animals called dogs coming in fighting over the stuff that's available for them in the garbage dump. And so what do dogs do when they fight over food? They gnash at each other with teeth. What happens when you have a funeral of people that, that they can't afford a, 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 a tomb on the Mountain of Olives they, the body has to be thrown into the, the dump, and so you have weeping. Mm. And what, what do you have when you have this <coughs> smell going over the city of Jerusalem? This is pretty stinky. And so they had an eternal fire. They put sulfur on the, the, the garbage and catch it on fire. You ever, you ever be in a bathroom and they have little matches there to the side? And <laughs> you're, you're, you're filling your, or you're, you mm -hmm. understand that you're human and you're, you're having some, getting rid of some, some some just stanky, and you're, you light a match. What does that do? To the the, the it gets rid of the smell. 
so they would be burning sulfur. And so where do we get the idea of weeping and gnashing and teeth and the eternal fire and the burning of sulfur? Hmm. So 15 of the 18 times that Jesus taught on Gehenna or hell, he was speaking direct. Matter of fact, a lot of times he could point to it. He said, he said, unless your life is a good example, it's worth this. It's not worthy of this. It's worth this. I'm not saying hell's not a place of weeping and gnashing burning. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the Bible talks about the Valley of Gehenna. Jesus says it's talking directly about the Valley of as a. It's just like a pastor today using a current situation as an example for a message. That your your life has to be worth something, or it's just going to go into there. And these are just practical things, you know. So that's what. Uh, he taught on parables all the time. He used yeah, parables. always. What's what's the, the verse we were going to? Romans. Oh, this is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. You got to hear this. Romans chapter seven, verse one. Now, Romans was written, and, and that's nothing but Bible study. You need to understand who the people group is that the Bible, the book is written to. You have to understand that it's going to mess you up. Uh, and you need to understand spirit, soul, and body. And one other thing you need to understand is on the other side of the card that we've given some of you is you have a, uh, a picture of what I called an eternity line with the cross in the middle. <coughs> that there are certain things that happen on the left side of the cross and certain things that are happening on the right side of the cross. And here is the kicker. Everything on the left side of the cross, any teaching in this book, has to go through the cross. Has to. Even some of the teachings of Jesus... What did the blood do to what was taught in the past before the cross? The blood touches everything. Yeah. And there's so many people teaching principles out of the old covenant into the new covenant. We have What we have is new covenant believers with old covenant mindsets. We know more about the old covenant than we do the new covenant. Do you realize how, how, many, how many commandments are there in the old covenant? Come on, this is an easy good one. How many, there's ten commandments. Okay. How many laws in the Old Covenant to the Jewish people? 613. 613 laws. You can't show me a place in the Old Covenant where the, Jew, the, the Gentiles were ever under the Jewish law. Wow. How many people know how many covenants or commandments are in the New Covenant? There's two. There's not ten. How many laws oh, are in... Are you putting that up behind me in your cheating? I did. You're cheating again, aren't you? Well, Let that no, break. I was waiting. <laughs> Does anybody know how many laws are in the New Covenant? How come we don't know the laws of the New Covenant? Don't covenants have commandments and laws? Why do we use the Old Covenant commandments and laws to govern the New Covenant? Okay, I'm going to put it up. Okay, now you can put it up. <laughs> There's five laws in the New Covenant. And most people have heard them, but they don't understand them. They should they, they, they read right past them. It, it's amazing how the church has not... We, we mixed Moses and Jesus. You realize when they went to the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses? You realize when you're baptized, you're not baptized into Moses. You're baptized into Jesus. The other one first. So in, in, in Romans, oh, you're going to t take a picture. Let's go. Yeah, a lot of people take pictures. It's faster. That kind of answered your question what you asked the other night, Jay. Here, here's some of the laws of the new covenant. Uh, one of the laws in Romans eight two is one of my favorite ones. It says, "For the for the law, say the law, law. of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's a law. Has set us free from the what?" The law of sin and death. So the new covenant law has trumped the laws of sin and death. What are the laws of sin and death? Where did that start? In the garden. If you eat of this tree the day, you'll surely what? All the laws in the old covenant are based on death. If you sin, you die unless there's a sacrifice to pay the price for that sin. You sin, you die. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. Everybody say free. Free. From the law of sin and death. James chapter 
uh, she'll, she'll put those up there, I'm sure. That James chapter 1, verse 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. It's called the perfect law of what? Liberty. Liberty. Where's that in the Old Covenant? It's not. They weren't in liberty. Stand fast in the liberty in which Christ has made us free. Mm -hmm. That's a law. Wow. Five laws, two commandments. I, I love doing this to people. Man, we, I hadn't got back to Romans chapter... 7 verse 1. 7 verse 1. But, but do, you, do you realize, and I, I do this on purpose, and people quit raising their hands and responding because they don't like being wrong, you know? Because they get their value and their dignity from their, from their information instead of... I know you don't raise your hand. You know not raise your hand. And I'm not allowed to raise your hand. What? I said, I'm not allowed to raise my hand. No, you're not allowed to raise your hand. You just open your mouth and tell them anyway, right? <laughs> so, but what, we just need to understand that we're New Covenant believers with Old Covenant mindsets. And the Scripture actually calls that spiritual adultery. <coughs> okay? And we're going to get to that. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Are you sure? It, it is written to the church in Rome. Where is, what country... We need to think about it. What country is Rome in? Italy. They're Italians. Yeah. <laughs> They're Italians. But there were Jews there that had been converted to Christianity. And so you have a mixed group of Gentiles and Jews that had been that, that had a Jewish mindset that still that had been converted to Jesus that still understood the law. But the Gentiles didn't understand the law. They weren't taught the law. Mm. You got it? And so that's why it starts out in Romans chapter 7, verse 1. It says to all the saints that are in Rome. Well, look at Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Excuse me. We were in 7, 1. Excuse me. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. There's a dyslexic thing happening again. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Put that on the board, Joy. Romans 7. Excuse me. There it goes again. Romans 1, verse 7 says, to all those that are in Rome. All the Jews and Gentiles. Now in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, it says this. I speak to those who know the law. So now he speak, he's taking this whole, all the chapters is to everybody except for this one. These next couple verses, he's, he's isolating just to the Jewish people that, that are born again believers and understood Christianity, but still understood the Mosaic Law. It says, now I'm speaking to you that know the, the law. And it talks about a, a woman that is married to a man. And she's, she's under his law as long as that man's alive. And if she, under this man's law, goes out and marries somebody else, she is called a what? This is not a marriage seminar. This is a principle of law. She's an adulteress. But if this man dies, she's free from that what? So she can marry another. That's basically what verses 2, three, two and 3 are talking about. But look at verse 4. Man, this is so, someone read verse 4. <clears throat> Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married right to another. You, you've been, he's talking to the Christians that were Jews. That understood the law, tell him, you gotta remember, you're dead to Moses. Dead to yeah. Moses is dead. So you can be married to Jesus. Yeah. Why? So you can bear fruit. Because you're not gonna bear fruit in the midst of spiritual adultery, being married to Jesus and still living under the laws of Moses. Yeah. You can't you can't bear the fruit, the church isn't bearing fruit because we're living in adultery. We're married to Jesus, but we're living under a man's law. You know, kind of, you know. We don't even know what our husband's law is. We're still living under old husband's law. Oh, come on. Wait a minute. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. No, chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 1. She's going to put it on the board if you don't know. I read out the New King James, not that it's special, but um, when you're dyslexic, you don't like changing versions. Mm -hmm. 
Second Corinthians chapter 10. It might be better. Hold on a second. It's 11. Second Corinthians chapter, chapter 11, verse 1. You've probably heard this verse, but maybe it should make a little bit of difference right now. Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed, you do not bear with me. Listen to this. For I... Now, who's writing this? The Apostle Paul writing to Gentiles. Say Gentiles. Gentiles. Was he a Gentile? No. He was a Jew. Mm -hmm. Did he know the law of Moses? Yes. Did he write the book of Romans? Yep. For I am jealous for you. Why would he be jealous of Gentiles? They weren't under the law. It goes a little deeper than that. They were never given the law. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you. You hear the marriage in this? I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Why was he jealous? Because he'd already been married before. Yeah. He wasn't a virgin. And in that culture, that's huge. He'd already given his allegiance to one other husband. And now he's realizing he can't be that pure, chaste virgin like Gentiles. Gentiles were never under the law. Mm. But they are. They're chaste. We are chaste. You need to realize we're not God's bride. We're the bride of Christ. We're presented as a... This word presents us as a chaste virgin to our bridegroom. Something Paul could never be again. Because once you give it up, you can't get it back. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul being jealous of a group of people that were not a, not a people? Mm. Wow. So that's, a, that's why we believe so much on the separation. I, I, I'm not saying all Scripture is inspired. Don't say I'm not. All Scripture is inspired. It's all good. But we are governed by the do I put James chapter 2, verse 12? We're all judged not according to the Ten Commandments. Do you realize that? Do you realize the 613 laws really don't apply to us as Gentiles? Matter of fact, the Jews can't even perform a lot of them because they don't even have the temple anymore. But even if they did, there was only about 70 of the 613 laws that applied to normal people. The rest were priestly things and happened in the the way that they did their sacrifices and things like that. So there's only about 700, 70 of the 613 that personal little, little people like us that weren't priests could, were responsible for. But look at James chapter... Now, who was the book of James written to? Jesus. Does anybody know? Jews. A little, the little 12, better than that. The 12 tribes. The, it starts out at the very tribes. beginning. The 12 tribes scattered... 12 tribes of what? Israel. Yeah. Israel. Yeah. So James's book is written to the Israel, Israel-minded, Jewish-minded people, people that had been judged by the, the law all their life, all their culture. And I love the feast. I love all the ceremonials. I love all the 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 seven. I mean, it's all shouts Jesus. Okay, but watch this. So do, and so speak is those that will be judged according to the law of liberty. He's talking to people that all their life were lived being judged by the law of condemnation. The Bible is full of this. We're, we're going we're gonna to do this, if you don't mind. Uh, put your, some of you have already done this. You know what's coming. So, 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 everybody just follow Charles. First or second? Do what? First or second? Second. Second Corinthians chapter. Two. Now she's gonna she's gonna put the words of the scriptures on the board, and I'm gonna ask that you can try to hold your Bible and do all. Don't you, don't take notes. Just just you can take notes after this. But this is a little exercise. I've done this with. 
few people. Well, some very qualified people, okay? Uh, with doctors of theology. You must be talking about men saved on car. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I, I've been I've been blessed to be able to share this with people that know the Bible so much more than I do. <clears throat> you know, oh, I had a real dear friend that was uh, the director, administrator, the the head big way of Christ for the nations, and uh, and uh, the time I shared this with him, he uh, was in tears. Because he had just taught it the way he had always taught it. But when you pray and ask the Holy Spirit, which you all did, you agreed with the prayer that I prayed, to open the eyes of your understanding, mm -hmm. you have to be prepared for some new information. Amen. You've got to be teachable. Revelation. Revelation's coming. Not information. Information will inform you, but revelation will empower you. Mm -hmm. I know so many people that know the doctrine of grace but don't have the revelation of it. Because with the doctrine, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna get to this in a second. <laughs> Sorry, rabbit trail. I know you hate it. I know you hate it. But just hate away. <laughs> go ahead. Feel free. I'm free. <laughs> no. Law of liberty. Yeah. No. Where <laughs> the like spirit is, of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is. Right. Go ahead. Uh, we'll just get into this. Well, okay, where are we going now? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll quit taking rabbit trails. Okay. What I want you to do is put your hands out like this. You can read a book, and I'm going to read it here. It's New King James. And when I mention something about the Old Covenant, I need to know you understand what we're talking about. And so I want you to put that in your left hand. Old Covenant, Old covenant in your left hand. Okay, when I read something, and I'm just going to read it word for word, and I'm not going to change a thing. Something about the new covenant, I want you to put it in your right hand. And the way I know you put it in the right hand is you're just going to wiggle it. One hand is going to start getting heavy, and one hand is going to start getting light. Okay, all 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is talking about is the separation of two covenants. But you won't understand this passage, this chapter, without understanding what it's about. So, we're going to start, as a little practice, we're going to start with verse 3. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink. Move the left hand. Okay? So, it's not with ink, but by the Spirit, move the right hand, of the living God. Not on tablets of stone. Move the left hand. Got it? But of the flesh, move the right hand. That is of the heart. See, God, His goal is not to get Scripture in your head. It's to get it in your heart. Mm -hmm. God doesn't... Faith is some, an attitude of the heart, not the head. It's not agreeing with Scripture. It's being revealed in your heart. Praise God. So watch this. So verse 4, and we have such trust through Christ, through God, that we are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything being from ourselves, our sufficiency from God, who also made us sufficient ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, move the left hand, but of the spirit, move the right hand, for the letter kills. And the Spirit gives life. Now, what's this a reference to? If you don't know, let me explain it to you. How many people died? Now, if you know the answer. Yes, sir. And some of the other ones. Okay. If you know the answer, let them think for a little bit. How many people died the first day the law showed up on Mount Sinai? Okay, those that know the answer. 3,000 people died the first day the law showed up and the law killed it. How many people were brought back in Acts chapter 2? 3,000. Because the Spirit brings life. Law kills. Beautiful. Spirit gives life. Whoa. Is this a... Yes. It's a picture of the tablets of stone and the ministry of the Spirit. Let me show you how this works. Let's keep, I'm not... Verse... Verse chapter seven, excuse me, seven. 
But if the ministry of death, uh oh, written hmm. and engraved in stones, is that what that says? What was written and engraved on stone? Does anybody know? No. Any, no. I've never found a theologian to, to, no. to, to say that's stupid. There's only one thing that's been written and engraved on stone, and that's the basic foundation of the law. Mm -hmm. And what was its ministry? Death. Yeah. It was never meant to bring life. Because you break it, you die. Right. Whoa. And you can't keep but why do we hold it so dear? Because we've been taught wrong. Mm -hmm. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was what? Glorious. Let me explain the word glorious. The word glory, in a, in a, it's a vast word, but in a simple understanding, the word glory is God's view and His opinion. When we what we call as glorious, it's just the way God has always seen it. It's his reality. When someone is healed, it's oh, that's glorious. It's just God's view and opinion. It's his reality. When he sees you sinless and without sin, that's just the way God sees you. You don't see yourself that way. You have a hard time because you're you have an unrenewed mind to your past. It's not been renewed. So when when, when you see God's glory, it's just his view, it's his opinion. Manifested on earth. Do you have that? Okay, so watch this. So, the Ten Commandments, the written engraved on stones, was what? But if this ministry of death, written engraved on stones, was what? Glorious. Glorious. It's God's opinion for that dispensation. For that period of time, for the children of Israel, they were under the Ten Commandments. So that the, uh, excuse me, but if the ministry of death, written engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses, because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was what? Passing away. What was happening to this glory? Passing away. It's going down. But what did he do? Let's just go ahead and read. It says, it was passed away. How will the ministry of the Spirit, move the right hand, be more glory? So as this one's going down, this one's coming up. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? For the ministry of condemnation had glory. Remember, that, that's the left hand. Was it? Have you ever been to? Oh my gosh, have you ever been to church and you walked out feeling like a semi truck just ran you over? Mm -hmm. Condemned. Condemned and killed and run over and bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. <laughs> you just been hammered by the law. Never did what exactly what it was supposed to do. It was supposed mm -hmm. to kill you, make you feel condemned. Mm -hmm. But that's not the gospel. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness, oh, wait a minute, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious, this over here, had glory in this respect because the glory that excels. Had no glory. Had no glory. Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed the one word. This had no glory. This, this glory is not the same glory. For if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Show me in Scripture where God told him to do that. Not in there. You won't find it. He put the veil over his face so the people wouldn't see the truth. Mm -hmm. They want he wanted them to think the same glory he always had was still as bright and shiny as it had always been. They were supposed to see that the glory was fading away to prepare them for the righteousness of God mm -hmm. through Christ Jesus. They were supposed to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah. Because this was passing away, but he put a veil over his face at the very beginning to show, to keep them from seeing the truth. How do I know that? Let's keep reading. <laughs> Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so the children could could, uh, could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were what? Fine. Not their eyes. Their minds were blinded, for until this day 
The same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the... Everybody move your left hand. Yes. Look it up in your Bible. I'm not making this up. Welcome to the red pill. You know what I mean by the red pill? The matrix. The matrix. You ever seen the matrix? You take the blue pill, you go back to sleep and live in your own little religious world and go on and live the way you... Or you can take the red pill and I'll show you how deep it really goes. Mm -hmm. Truth sets you free. It doesn't put you in bondage. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is what? Lying. Freedom. <laughs> Pray for it. Okay. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, everybody say this day. This, this day. day. Right now. Right now. When Moses is read. When Moses, now what's it say when Moses is read? It's not about the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the law is read, a veil lies over your heart. See, it's the heart, not the head. If you if you have a veil over your heart and you can't see the truth, your mind will go back to what it always knew. But when your heart is set free, when it's healed, when it comes into the revelation of what Jesus really has done for us at Calvary, remember everything in the, old, the left side of the cross has to go through the blood of Jesus in the cross and come out the other. Was there circumcision in the old... On, in the Old Covenant. Yeah. Yeah. Is there circumcision in the New Covenant? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Did the blood change it? Say yes. Yeah. Circumcision of the flesh here. Circumcision of the heart here. Mm. The blood, the cross changed it. You'll see on the card that I gave some of you, there's a whole list of a couple things there. Just what well, was on this side of the cross. It has to go through the cross. What did the cross do to it on the other side? Let me show you this. In the Old Covenant, the Scripture says to kill your enemies. Right? What's it say in the New Covenant? Love, love, love your enemies. enemies. And what's the church do? We mix the covenants. We love to kill our enemies. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> That's when he told us, quit reading the Old Testament. That's what I meant. I didn't say forever. I just said, said for a year. I said for a year. <laughs> Oh, you tell people that? That's not, okay. that's not a good thing to do. <laughs> but I don't know how to explain it as much as you. <laughs> the problem is more, most people know more about the Old Covenant than they do the New Covenant. Yeah, because yeah. that's what we were talking about. Matter of fact, in John chapter, put, Jerry, put John, oh no, we're not done. Don't go. i got to take you. I, it's it's Alan's fault. He, he told me he loves when I take rabbit trails and <laughs> gets off the track. He, <laughs> Uh, you are on saying? 15. You are on verse 15. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, listen to this. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is what? Taken away. And what happens when the veil is taken away? You can see truth. You see truth. So a veil is taken away across Moses' face. What do you see? There's no glory in it no more. Oh, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> but we all, with unveiled faces, looking into a what? What happens when you look into a mirror and you got a veil over your face? Even if you can see through it, when it comes back, you're seeing the veil and not your face. Right. Yeah. So you're not seeing the truth. So the day that you can look into a mirror without the law in front of your face, what's it say? But we all with unveiled faces be holding in a mirror the what? Glory the view Lord. and opinion of God. People say, I'm seeing Jesus. No, you're not seeing Jesus. You're seeing you the way God sees you in His glory. Perfect. You become like what you look at. See, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, you won't understand scriptures that say that we're perfect, but we need to go on to perfection. Well, if we're perfect, why do we need to go on to perfection if I'm not perfect? Because you're perfect in the spirit. But you have to be perfected now in your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, which will manifest in your flesh. It says we're sanctified. Spirit, soul, because God's will for us to be sanctified. Spirit, soul, and body. Well, spirit and soul were the same thing. Why do you have to be sanctified in both? 
Sorry. That, that's what this is. You ever see the V8 commercials? Yeah. <laughs> People going to be in heaven going, oh, I could have had a V8. You know what I mean? Oh, I could have been healed. Oh, I could have been happy. Oh, I could have been at peace. You know, all this. Oh, this oh. But anyway, we need to understand that's a, that the gospel is not about putting us under bondage. It's about setting us free. Not to sin. To respond in love. But to love. God's just looking for people that will love His love. It's that simple. It's not mandating. It's not just love is love. He's coming back for Matter of fact, I, I, love what, I, I love what this is all about. Someone mentioned earlier about, you know the teachings of Jesus? I, I said have to go through the cross. This this hurts you. I, I like hurting. This hurts you. In, in, Luke, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, you have a story of the Good Samaritan. Okay, Don't get me started talking about that tonight because that uh, we, we do have time, but they'd like to sleep. I don't, okay? But it, there's a certain, that says there's a lawyer that came up to Jesus and he said, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what does the law say and what is your understanding of it? And I love that because the question is, now, what, what did Jesus say? What does the law say? That's a hint. He didn't say, what do I say? He said, what does the law say? Love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Now, how many people, don't raise your hand, <laughs> would believe that that's the two commandments of the new covenant? It's not. He said, well, you say, you say rightly. And the guy says, what must I do to justify myself? He says, well, who's my neighbor? Yeah. Now, we won't go any further than that, but in the place of Matthew, Jesus gets asked the same question again. Or He says, to love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Everybody knows that. It's in red letters, right? Mm -hmm. But I can take you to the book of John where it says something different. He says, love God with all your heart and love one another as I have loved you. Yes. In another place in John, he says it this way. He makes it real simple. A new commandment. Yeah. See? See, we know these things, but we don't put them together. A new commandment I give you. Love God with all your heart and love one another as I have loved you. That is a different set of commandments See, you've got to take the teachings of Jesus and bring them through the cross. The law said do it this way, but I say, love one another as I've loved you. Can I just insert just a moment? Man, think about that for a second. Because we don't really love ourselves very well. That's why we don't love people. You need a question? Yeah. So, so you you really can't love, like I can't love you. Until you experience. Until the, like I'm limited with how much I know he loves me. You can only love well when you've received his love well. Yeah. See, the old covenant, the whole principles of the old covenant, I don't know if you understand how the old covenant works. The old covenant works this way in simplicity. Man does something, God responds. Man sacrifices, God forgives. The new covenant, God's done it, and we respond to him. That's the difference in the covenants. Over here, God's waiting for us to do things and He responds to our doing. Let me throw this out there because I know everybody loves this prayer. If my people will pray, <laughs> I will heal their land. Oh, I forgot to humble themselves and pray. I'll heal their land. That sound like Old Covenant? That's where it's written in. Yeah. If people do something, I'll respond. In the New Covenant, mm. it's all done. Wait, he's waiting for us to respond to his goodness. Yes. The Apostle Paul said, I strive to obtain everything that he's done for me freely. It doesn't sound like he's waiting for God to respond to him. Yeah. He's responding to him. For us to understand what he's really done for us at Calvary is so glorious. But we are still married to Moses. <laughs> Don't think I'm getting rid of the Old Testament. I'm not. I love it. But we have to keep it in perspective. Let's let's go back to the verse we hadn't finished yet. In 2 Corinthians. 
Chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled faces beholding in the mirror the what? The glory of the Lord are being what? Not changed. The Bible has no place for being changed. It's talked about being transformed. Don't be conformed to this world. To be what? Transformed. Transformed. Changing is effort applied from the outside. I can change. If I take Play-Doh in my hand and squeeze it, I can put pressure on it from the outside and make it look like the inside of my hand. That's pure pressure. Charismatic pressure. Church. Religious pressure. Bow your head, close your eyes, kneel, and do all this pressure. We had a church one time in, in uh, Willis, Texas. Actually, yes, yeah, Willis. Called the, the title, the name of the church was... We, we had a statement. The Church of the Want-Tos. Why do you go to church? We want to. Why do you give? We want, want to. to. <laughs> Why do you pray? <laughs> oh, I want to. <laughs> Why do we worship? Oh, I want to. I don't. No, don't don't think this is rude. I don't need joy. You want her. I want her. And that makes a whole difference in your relationship. Trust me. She likes it better being wanted. You know what I'm saying? Think about your relationship. Do you need not to go to hell? Or do you want Him? Is it a need-based relationship? Or is it a love-based relationship? Oh. Let's finish this. You're being transformed into the same image from what? Okay, here's the hands. From this glory to this one. It's not a growth in glory. It's a change of glory. You're going from this form of law, condemnation, and death that's faded away to one that's bringing life, liberty, and the love of God. Very good. Man. That's in context. That's just verse by verse. And, you know, you got to look at scriptures like, uh, for, look, at, look at John chapter 1, verse 17. John chapter 1. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but what? Grace and truth. It's all over the place. Everybody do left hand. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus. Are they different messages? Yes! <laughs> Where is this a reference to? Matthew 17. You ever you know what Matthew 17 is all? Chapter 1, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Most people call it the mountain of transfiguration. Just X that out. I, I tell people at Bible school the best tool that you can have for your Bible study is white out. <laughs> and, and, and any subtitle you see, just go ahead and wipe that out because they're pre-programming you just to see what's there, and you miss the rest of the stuff. Was Jesus transfigured on the mountain of transfiguration? Say yes. yes. Is that what really took place? Say no. no. We miss it. Joy's going to put it on the board. It's there. It's up there. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. And you've got to slow down. That's one thing that's blessed me about being dyslexic. I've got to read slow. And so I usually see stuff that eh, other people just read right past. Now, after how many days? Six. six. Come on. Does anybody... What happened six days of creation? Say work. 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 What comes after six? I learned this in Texas school rest. system, okay? Rest. rest. Day of rest. So after six days... Wait a minute! Is this saying that there's been six days of work and now there's going to be a day of whatever's fixing to happen on top of this mountain... That on this side of the mountain was works, and on this side of the mountain it's rest? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now one version says, like, I think it says, before the eighth day or something like that, 
But eight, the number eight is a day of new beginning, so it works both ways. Now, what happened there? Let me just let, let me just read this to show you that this is so powerful. But people, and I'm I'm not sorry that you agreed to, for the Holy Spirit to be your teacher, but you know it's going to you're going to next Wednesday. You're going to go. Did mm -hmm. in chapter seventeen. It says this. Now after six days, so we're actually on the seventh day, the day of rest, Jesus took Peter, James, and... Yeah. Now how come you always see that? I think there's only one place, and it depends on what translation you look at. Uh, you always see it Peter, James, and John. You never see it John, James, and Peter. There's a reason for that. Watch this. <laughs> Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah were there with him. Who, what does Moses represent? Law. Law. What does Elijah represent? Prophets. Prophets. So you have the law of the prophets on this side, and you have Jesus on this side at the top of this mountain. Are we going to do Peter, James, and John? Not yet, okay. but we will. <laughs> and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. And Peter answered and said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, I love this part. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son here him. It doesn't say hear them. Yeah. Who had the Jewish people always been listening to? How did God speak to the Jewish people in their history? The law and the prophets. Yeah. Every time. The law and the prophets. In Hebrews chapter 1 it says in times past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews to the Hebrews. So watch this. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, It is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make us three tabernacles. It's just like a building program. As soon as God's doing something in church, everybody wants to build a pro program. <laughs> wants to build something. <laughs> Take an offering. He's just being whatever. But actually what is happening, is he's either bringing Jesus, wanting to bring Jesus up to the level of the law of the prophets, or bring the law of the prophets up to the level of Jesus. Make them equal. And he wants to hear from all three. But God stops him yeah. and says, no. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Jesus came and stood, uh, uh, touched them and said, arise and do not be afraid. Now what we need to understand about this is the word Arise doesn't mean he dictated to them. The word arise in the Greek literally means that he reached down and helped them up. They'd have to do it on their own accord. And I love what it says here. Verse 9, and as, oh, skip. Verse 8. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell this vision to know that this a great a great experience like this and just, shh, they just heard from God. God spoke to them personally. Don't tell nobody about this. Until when? Until the Son of Man is risen. So whatever this revelation was didn't it didn't start until after Calvary. This had to go... See, before the cross, the law and the prophets. 
the old covenant. But this truth was for after Calvary. So God spoke to the old covenant through the laws and the prophets. In the new covenant, taking that through the cross, he speaks to us through Jesus. John 1.17 said the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came. So the message that Jesus brought wasn't the law. He brought grace and truth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> let me show you how screwed up we are. Now we're not done with this. She won't let me be done with it. In the garden, there was lots of trees. And man could eat, Adam could eat from any of the trees he wanted except for one. And that was the tree of what? Knowledge. knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you know the answer to this already, we've talked about this, don't tell people. Let them think. Let them be wrong. <laughs> and God said, the moment that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll surely what? We die. Now, we know this stuff, right? So, evil knowledge will bring what? Say yeah. death. Yeah. Yeah. Good knowledge will bring what? Life. It'll bring death. True. Tree of the knowledge of good mm -hmm. and evil. True. <coughs> we focus so much on good knowledge, and it still brings death. Yeah. Because good up. knowledge brings self righteousness. Mm -hmm. It pops up. There's another tree called the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Let me say it this way there's a tree of life called Jesus. Yeah. See, the Pharisees knew the scripture, but they didn't know the truth. John chapter 8. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. He's talking to Pharisees. They knew scripture, but they, they, they knew the text, but they didn't know the truth of the text. People can argue with me all day long about the text. That's great. There's people who know more about the text, and they take pride in that. But sometimes you just don't have a sense they know anything about the truth of the text. You understand what I'm saying? Where's the Jesus in them? The information is there. Dogmatic, ugly, unforgiving, separating the body of Christ. But where's the truth? See, we can argue over the position of the Jews and God's plan for the Jews textually. But what's the truth? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever... You know, people don't know the truth. They know text. <coughs> They're eating from the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let me show you something here about Matthew 17. Who are the three disciples? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Man, they were, they were up here. Moses <coughs> and Elijah. You have the law and the prophets. You have Jesus. You have grace and truth. <coughs> And this is not a mountain of transfiguration. This is a mountain of transfer. Mm -hmm. What's happening is the authority of the Old Covenant is being transferred from the Law and the Prophets to Jesus. When they opened their eyes, there wasn't any Law and the Prophets. Where did Moses get the Law in the first place? Yeah. Say on a mountaintop? Yeah. Yeah. Mountain when God does stuff on a mountain, you better pay attention. <laughs> And he brought the law down in the first mountain. And so now he's in his journey. The law's on a journey. Say the law's on a journey. And he's the law's going up another mountain. This one. What do you what do you call the area between two mountains? Valley. David said, though I walk through the valley of the maybe it was a valley of shadow death, because that's the realm of the law. From this mountain to this mountain. Not the same mountain. They're different mountains. There's a valley in between the shadow of death. They're always under the law. <laughs> but he had a relationship like no other in that period of time. He had a new covenant understanding relationship under old covenant dispensation. <laughs> I'll fear no evil. Man. So what you have here, you have Peter, James, and John. So on the mountain of transfer, you have the law and the prophets being trans the authority the glory going from God used this over here was glorious for a season, but now that glory is being transferred to this righteousness on this side, grace and truth. 
Now, you would think we'd have some other information that would help us understand what's going on here, because a couple chapters before this, Jesus is saying the word needs to be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Well, how many witnesses do we have here on the mountain? Three. We have three. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know anything about your Bible, the first guy's name is Peter. And what does the word Peter translate to in our English language? Um, Petra. It talks about... Jesus actually says his name would be called Stone. We say it's Rock, because that's what Petra is. But Jesus said, your name will be... Uh, you'll be Stone. What's written engraved on stones? Uh, mm -hmm. The name James. Do you guys know what the name James means? Sir Planted. Sir Planted. Does anybody know what the name James, John means? Grace. It means grace. The three disciples that witnessed the law and the prophets being replaced by grace. Their names meant the law being replaced by grace. Wow. Whoa. Pretty deep. <laughs> I don't know how much more you can confirm that. Now, let me, <laughs> let me take you to another scripture real quick. I should have done this earlier, but that's the way it goes. Alan interrupted me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 7. You're going to do this, huh? What? Let me make sure that's the right James. Oh, no, no, that's not it then. No. Turn Romans. I believe it's in Hebrews, huh? I think somebody might have just gone. I understand. Check the Hebrews one. Well, what are you looking for? Hmm? Joey, tell him what he's looking for. <laughs> Where it says on the one hand. Oh. I think that's Hebrews, but it's maybe four. The what? Hebrews what? No, it's 718. Is it? How come I'm not reading it? Because I'm not in seven. <laughs> okay, Romans chap. Uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter seven, verse eighteen. Remember, we did the exercise with the hands. Yeah. The God is so good. He just gave me this scripture one day. It says, "For on the one hand." Is it hot? I'm already enjoying it. For on the one hand, there's an annulling of a former commandment because of the weakness and the unprofitableness. For the law had made nothing perfect, but on the other hand. See how the Bible fits together? You have 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 3 talking about on this hand and this hand you have not a transfer on this side and this side you take it through the cross on this there's no profit on this there's on this hand there's no profit on this hand it's all profit it, it's, it's just a wow and as Joyce said I don't know if you heard her say it under her breath what hand is this? the poop hand if someone slaps you on the right hand, right cheek with the law, <clears throat> turn the other cheek until they give you grace. <laughs> yeah, they have to like that. Come on. I heard you say that. Come on. No, it's just that was too big. Oh. And just to show you how some of this works, now we, we, we talk all the time, and 
and I should open it up for questions. And I love questions, even if they're contradictory. I love it because it's okay to disagree. It is okay in the body of Christ. It should be the safest place to disagree. It really should. We should our, our ego shouldn't be based on our information. It's based on the information about us from Him. Jesus said the first temptation that Jesus was about turning the rock into bread. It says, if you be the Son of God, Thanks. prove it. Works performance. Performance-based Christianity. Stop it! Jesus said, man's not going to live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And He says, you're His. He says that He's forgiven you of all your trespasses and sin as far as the east is from the west. Man. How come we don't believe that? Because we just got it up here. We haven't really repented. The word repent, we, we, we dabble in what is called Paleo-Hebrew. Do you know what Paleo-Hebrew is? Paleo-Hebrew is the ancient Hebrew language that they learned how to write their language in hieroglyphics back when they were in Egypt. And they have a, a picture language. All the letters in the Hebrew language had a picture, corresponding picture and a number. And the original language of Hebrew was Paleo-Hebrew. And then when they went to Babylon, they, it, the, those pictures morphed into block letters. And that's when they begin to change and turn into blocks. So if you really <coughs> want to know the original pe meaning of a word or something, you can go back to Paleo-Hebrew. And, and the word... The, 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 that's just an example of one of the letters. The, the, the words, the, the two pictures for fire is a... Uh, it's an aleph, which is the first letter of the Jewish alphabet, and a, a, a shin, which is teeth. It's, it's not the word for fire. It's, no. it's the word for fire. Okay. And that's, but it means all, it means uh, 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 aleph is the first letter. It's usually referred to God, but it also means with great authority, and fire is destruction. And so you have the word fire is with great authority, great de or great destruction, okay? And so the word for repent <coughs> is the picture of fire burning up a house. So you have great destruction burning up a house. That's the picture, the pale of Hebrew for the word repent. So what's that tell us? That means you've got to leave everything behind. When you really repent, you cut off your past and you walk away from it. You leave it. You don't go back. And we see this in the children of Israel uh, going through the Red Sea. You know, when when when, when was... I just rambled. I don't know. I'm do, sorry. you want to do that verse in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 11? I think that... Isn't that the one? That's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Well, does everybody know what Passover? Everybody knows Passover? Jewish holiday? Do you understand what it represents? Say salvation? The blood was shed. Do you realize that the children of Israel, when they sacrificed the lamb, when the lamb was shed from the the blood was shed from the lamb, they weren't saved. When were they saved? By the application of the blood on the doorpost. So how does that correlate? With the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says all these things were done as examples for us. As in what? As examples. for us. Examples for us. Okay. So when we go back to so verse 1, it talks about the children of Israel coming out of their bondage. Being baptized into Moses, going through the cloud by day, fire by night. The process of their life from, from bondage to freedom to the promised land. is it, It's all an example to us. And so with that example... What do we see? What we see is the sacrifice of the Lamb. Jesus at the cross doesn't save you. It's the application of what He did at the cross on your heart. We have to apply the blood onto the doorpost of our heart to receive the benefit of the sacrifice of the Lamb at Passover. Okay? That's Bible. It's not ultimate reconciliation. Well, Jesus died for everybody. Everybody saved. That's what some people say. No. They had to apply yeah. the blood. That I heard that theology on it. And so what happens after that? The moment there's that the next day, the scripture says, not one feeble was among them. Isn't that what the Bible says? Mm -hmm. Got a question. Do you think there were some the day before? Do you think there were some old people that had bruises and broken bones and hurt 
and they were messed up because of the abuse and the 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 bondage, the bondage and the work that they had as slaves. Absolutely. So the next day after they received salvation, you had corporate healing. So don't tell me you don't believe in healing with salvation. Never thought of it like that. That's why we're here. Yeah. What else did they have? Prosperity. They could take whatever they wanted from the Egyptians. All the gold and silver and cattle. What you want them out of here? Whatever they wanted, they could take it. And they were strong enough to do it. They would. But they didn't take it for their own benefit. You know, God used that in the later part to build His temple. It wasn't for their self gain. So their salvation anyway, provided healing and prosperity. It's right there. Not only that, they were led out in the wilderness with a fire by night and cloud by day. What's a fire do at night in the wilderness? Morning. What's a cloud do in the desert? What's it, what's it do in Durant in the summer? <laughs> it brings comfort. That's why the Holy Spirit's known as the great comforter, because it's a type and shadow of being saved and filled with the Spirit. The closer you are to the, the fire, the warmer you are. You know you're not where you're supposed to be when you're chilly at night, because you got you're too far from the presence. He had to come close. But was Pharaoh still after him? Everybody say yes. yes. Physically. Physically. Still after him. And then they come to the Red Sea. What gets cut off at the Red Sea? Physical. What? And they're baptized. So you have saved, filled with the Spirit, Water baptized. No, it doesn't say water baptized to be saved. <clears throat> water baptized is a sign of discipleship going on because your enemy gets cut off. You, if you if it's done in faith, the enemy will be cut off. The, the, the principalities and powers that's been after you all your life, if it's done in faith, can cut off. Here's the principle. Demons can't swim. You want more scripture for that? Jesus cast the evil spirits out of the demoniac yeah. into where? Into the pigs. Where did the pigs go? They would rather die in the water than be possessed by pig, uh, by demons. And the demons had to come out because they can't swim. Than where did evil spirits come from? Where did demons come from? Say the disembodied spirit. Uh, a, a demon is a disembodied spirit. Disembodied from what? The Nephilim before the flood. Mm -hmm. The flood came, and guess what? The spirits had to leave the bodies mm -hmm. because they can't swim. That's why they want the body. That's why they want the body, so they can be effective on the planet. They're looking for somebody to inhabit so they can manipulate and to do their will. So when a person's baptized mm -hmm. into discipleship, go make disciples, not converts. Mm -hmm. If, if baptism is done right, if done in faith, you can literally cut off the onslaught of the enemy. And according to the Jewish, Jewish people, the only problem they ever had with Pharaoh again. Mm -hmm. Oh, we remember the garlics and the leeks. Why are we out here? Warfare is right here. Mm -hmm. Between your ears. Yeah. Yeah. It's right here. It's strongholds of the mind, it's called. Mm -hmm. and usually that's founded in the law. Most people have a terrible time getting rid of the law that they were raised in. Mm -hmm. Unplugging. Just like I, we, we, we could go through. Did they have faith in God? Say yes. When, when the, did they do this with the doorbell? Did they have faith in God through the wilderness? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did they have faith in God going to the Red Sea? Say yes. yes. Next, next event, they come to the promised land. <clears throat> Did they have faith in God? No. They had an evil heart of unbelief. What happened? How long a period of time was, was it from crossing the Red Sea to going to the Promised Land? Four years. No. The first time. Oh, oh yeah, first time, yeah. It's only like a month and a half. Yeah. Two months. Yeah. If that. And they had faith in God, faith in God, faith in God, and now they have evil hearts of unbelief. What happened in between there? No. There's only one thing in Bible history that happened. They passed a mountain. Where they got the law. And the law showed them what was wrong with them instead of what was right for God. 
They didn't have a problem with unbelief before, though. <coughs> when they were slaves for bondage, being oppressed, beaten. They didn't have an identity problem. Yes, it's God. You ain't go, God. <laughs> On this side of the cross, the, the, wait a minute. How many spies went, how many spies went into the promised land? Twelve. Twelve. How many came out? Twelve. Twelve. How many said you can't have what God said you can have? Can't do what God says you can do? Can't be who God says you already Ten. are? Ten. How many said you can do? Two. Two. How many Ten Commandments are there? Ten. Ten. How many two in the New Covenant? Ten. Wow. <laughs> the Ten will keep you out and the two will get you in. Right. That's good stuff right there. You know what I'm saying? Those are nuggets. Amazing. Only Bible merch like that stuff. Right? And so you, you, you can take their whole life going through. Got a question. Who led them to the promised land? Joshua. No. Right. To the promised land. Not into it. Moses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Moses represents the what? Oh. Who led them into the promised land? Yeah. Joshua. How do you say Joshua in modern age? Jesus. Jesus! <laughs> the law would never take them into the promised land. But Jesus. Grace and truth will. The two commandments and the five laws of the new covenant will cause you to live within the promised land on earth. But you got to unplug <coughs> from your old husband that we weren't even supposed to be under in the first place. But we accepted it. The story goes on. What, what was the next thing they had? When they crossed over. Oh, this is the, Joshua 3.16. Put it on the board. Everybody knows the story. Joshua 3.16, when the waters overflow the banks at the time of harvest more than any other time, the priest took the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Does everybody know what the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is? Say Jesus. Say Calvary. So for 40 years in the wilderness, the law is leading them. They're following. They're looking forward to the cross. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Right? Everybody got the picture? They're going this way. There, here's the people. Here's the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Joshua 3, 16, the priests bring the Ark into the river and it stops in the middle of the river. And the water backs up. See, what was keeping them out of the Promised Land? Say the Jordan River. Jordan. The Jordan River is what was contrary and against them at the time. How? What was against them? Say the law. The law. How far back did God push the Jordan River in this story. All the way back to a town called Adam. Where was the first law given? Adam. Adam. In other words, at this point in time, because the Calvary, the cross, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, God pushed back everything that was keeping them out of the promised land living out of the way so they'd have free access to go into the promised land. And on this side, they passed by the cross for the first time. They passed by the ark. And now we're on this side of the cross and the cross is following them throughout history. That's where we're at today. Jesus has paid the price. for all. He, he has fulfilled the law all the way back to Adam. And that town is still there today. We've seen it. It's still there. It's called Adam. You have to think about it. You think God called that town Adam just because it sounded good? No. He had planned for that town to be there. He, he took what was in our way, out of the way, all the way back to a place called Adam. Now, what was you know, now here's what's really amazing. The, the next chapter, chapter 4, talks about telling... Uh, tell them, uh, take one person from each tribe, get one big stone from the middle of the river, and take it and put it over here on this side, right? Not on that side, but on this side. And the key word you're going to see throughout the chapter is the crossover. Why build this this altar of twelve stones? It's to it says literally says so the children's children's children in the future when they see this that they know that this is the day that God that the children of Israel crossed over into the promised land living. Now what did start of the trip? Say the Passover. Passover. Why don't they celebrate the crossover? They're told to. They're told to celebrate because they celebrate this event. The day of the crossover. Now see, that's our job. We sell there under the law. We celebrate the crossover. We enjoy Passover, 
But oh, we celebrate the crossover, what Jesus did at the Calvary. What was the very next thing that happened? Wait a minute. No faith in God. Oh, they had faith in God, faith in God, faith in God. Heal, law. No faith in God. Forty years later, they're coming up the, the river, the river parts, they cross, they set up this altar. Boom, the next thing that happens, what happens? You can do this through the whole Israel history. It's, there's a place called Jericho. And they did what God said. Did they have faith in God? Mm -hmm. Did the walls come down? Mm -hmm. Faith in God. Faith in God. Faith in God. Evil heart of unbelief. No faith in God. Faith in God. They cleared out all the promised land all the way through until there was peace in the land. Man. What's amazing about that is the children of Israel have 12 tribes. Two and a half tribes did not want to live in the promised land. Because mm -hmm. they had just enough. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to live in God's mm -hmm. best? That used to bother me. What really bothered me was I saw believers not wanting to live in God's best. They just wanted to just enough. Or just, yeah. uh, and God showed me this story. says, it was okay with me that two and a half tribes stayed behind. Mm -hmm. Why does it bother you? So it doesn't bother me more when I see Christians <laughs> that don't want to have God's best. Right. But there's some, <clears throat> no matter what you tell them, they'll just never want God's best. They'll just settle with just, just getting into heaven's fine with me. Just making it in. Just, just. They're just Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Oh, I want it all. Come on. I, I mean, this, this is so full of New Covenant, Old Covenant. And when you understand the Jewish culture, the history, the names, you know, the. the does everybody understand how Abraham, Abram, and Abraham? Does you know how that works? Abram had a name. His name was Abram before his Abraham, and Jehovah in the Jewish language. If you look at Psalms one nineteen, most people have the 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 alphabet, the Jewish alphabet, in their Bible in Psalms one nineteen. But the the word Jehovah has two H's. We call them H's. The haze uh, in Jehovah, huh, okay, and God took one of the H's out, and it's a it's a word for life, and it's the number five in the letter sequence. Five represents what? Grace. 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 And so God took life and grace and put it into Abram, and he became Abram Ham, right? Well, that's a great story, and that's really cool, and that's people go, ooh, that's amazing, yeah, because we won't get into the whole story, because it's a really good story how it all take place, but. For the sake of time, what about Sarah? Her name was Sarai, yes. not Sarah. Right. So God had to put another one of his H's into Sarai to make her Sarah. Uh, but there's a difference. Is she putting it on the board? I, I can't remember what we called that one, so I'm looking for that slide. The word Sarai is spelled, the first letter in the word Sarai is a yod. You know, yod, it looks like a little apostrophe in the Hebrew language. It's the number 10. Mm. Sarai starts with the number 10. What does 10 represent? 10 commandments. Mm -hmm. It represents the law. Are you ready for this? God didn't just take an H and put it down into Sarai, make her Sarah. He took out the ten and put in the grace. He took out the law and put in the grace. Because you can't have grace and law <laughs> in the same. Mm -hmm. Grace replaces the law. Mm -hmm. And she could give birth and she could breastfeed in grace. Because you can't breastfeed in law. Right. Oh, man. I just found it. You just put it on the board. Let them see it. Okay, so here's there's Jehovah. That's Jehovah. Has the two H's. See them? They look like that. I'll trust you can see it. There's Abraham. Abraham. Abram and Abraham. There's both of them. Took the H, just dropped it down in there. But oh, here's Sarai. Here's Sarai. 
See the yod, the little the little thing up there? Yeah. Here's the yod, what the yod looks like. And that's what the yod looks like. It's the yod is number 10, 10th letter. You don't see there's, there's Sarai, and she became Sarah. But where's the yod? The law oh. has left oh. the building. Uh, yeah. It's everywhere. There's both of them. There's a message that we haven't heard in church. We're still taught the law, and it keeps us in bondage and slavery, and we're committing adultery to our bridegroom <coughs> because we're not living under his. I encourage you to study the five laws of the new covenant. Find out what they are. Mm-hmm. Find out what the five laws, we, we put them on with the five laws of the new covenant. Wow. Be married to Jesus. And live under his law. And watch the fruit manifest. Now I can go all night. Any questions? Any comments? Any input? Any things I need to make clear? I thought for sure when we were talking about the river Jordan that you were going to tie it all the way up to Jesus being baptized there as well. Well, we could do that. But if you go to Colossians, Joy, put Colossians chapter 1, two verses. 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Let's start at verse 11 in Colossians. You're doing that, huh? Well, just real quickly. No, we're not going to do the epic, do I? No. Oh, did you want that other one? Okay. Yeah, that's good. I'm going back to the other one real quick. Who wants a picture? Yeah, did you get, did you get your first answer question? Your first question answer about the Jews? Well, sort of not really. <laughs> Joy went off subject. You know. I wish you wouldn't do that. <laughs> Are you ready, Joy? Colossians chapter 2? Yes. Verse, verse 11. In Him were, we were also <laughs> circumcised with circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, that's why you were Gentiles, he has made a life together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. The question is, when did he forgive you of your trespasses? When you said, oh, forgive me? No. No, don't even bring that up. <laughs> And you being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out. Everybody take your left hand. <laughs> the handwritings of the requirements that was against us, and which is contrary. In Greek, there's two words here, against and contrary. They're military terms. One is literally overt, and the other one is covert. But they're both against. They're, they're two different words with the same meaning, but two different applications. A covert operation is what? Secret. It's on the inside. Overt is obvious on the outside. And so what we have here is that there was something that was against us that was covertly and overtly against us. The law was against us on the outside as Gentiles, and it it affects us on the inside. It's against us on the inside. You may be free from the law on the outside, but are you still <coughs> in bondage on the inside? Let's talk about the Day of Atonement sometime. That would change the way you walk. Okay? But it says here, Having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it. Say it. Yeah. To the cross. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus hang on the cross and say, It is finished. He didn't say I am. Mm -hmm. He said it is. What was finished at Calvary? What did he... Got a question. How many crosses are there at Calvary? Three. How many does the church pay attention to? One. Think we're missing something? Yeah, the other two are not there just for Kodak moment to keep the frame balanced. (laughs) Jesus is hanging on one cross and what does it say here was nailed on the other? No, it says the law of requirements that was against us, the Ten Commandments, were nailed to the cross, taken out of 
our way. Another scripture for that is Ephesians chapter 2. Man, how come we don't know this stuff? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. For He Himself is our peace. What did they did they have peace in the old covenant? Say no. no. For Himself is our peace, who has made both one, both what Jew and Gentile, right? Yeah. And has broken down the middle wall of what? In the temple there was a wall called the wall of the Gentiles. Gentiles couldn't all go past it, or they'd be stoned to death. That wall has been taken out of the way. What's the wall made out of? Say stones. Stone. What's written engraved on? Stones, the law. Having abolished in his flesh, say flesh, flesh, the enmity. Next time you have communion, hold up that wafer, hold up that body. Say, thank you, Jesus, that I'm dead to Moses and I can be alive to you. I can be married to you because of what you did in your flesh. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did in your flesh. Communion is about remembering him, not remembering you. Mm-hmm. It's more than just a ceremony. You remember what he did in his flesh. Amen. In his body, the scripture, Romans chapter 7, verse, one, uh, verse 4. In his body, Moses is dead. Here it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Does anybody understand what we're talking about? That in his flesh he abolished the law of the old covenant. You hadn't heard a preacher ever say that during communion. How come? Aren't we supposed to do this in remembrance of him? Mm -hmm. Oh. Going back to Colossians? Yeah, go back to Colossians. Let me just show you. Some people, oh, you're just talking about the ceremonial law. Okay, no, I'm not. Look at Colossians chapter 2 again. Look at verse 16. I'll read verse 15. I'll yeah, I mean. Having disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them triumphing over it, over them in it. That's called the apex do it, my God. If you've never heard of, of, of the apex do it, my God, you really don't understand the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. Where did that take place? When did that take place? And who saw it? It said it was a public spectacle. Where he disarmed, that's a military term. General MacArthur did it at the end of World War II. Verse 16, So let no one judge you in food, in drink, or regarding festivals, or new moons, or... How many people are told that if you don't worship on the Sabbath, you're going to hell? Mm. Don't let anybody judge you. When, um, Got a question. When is the Sabbath? Sorry. Every day. Let me ask it another way. Who is the Sabbath? Jesus. 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 To a Jew, Saturday is the day they're told. I got four scriptures to show you it's against the law of Moses for a Gentile to worship on the Sabbath. Which to a Jew, it's Saturday, right? Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Christians, um, America, uh, Christian people, the way back, just not Americans, but they, it was changed to Sunday because that's the day of the resurrection. Right. The day they believe the church. So that's the day the church holds holy, but the Jew holds Saturday, the Christians hold Sunday, but all of that, listen to me, all of this, everything on that side of the cross is a type and shadow, say shadow, Shadow. of a good thing to come. Mm -hmm. I don't, I rest in Christ Jesus and Him alone. I don't rest on a day. I'll take it. I mean, there's a principle of rest that's just good. Sure, use that wisdom. But you're not, if you're trusting your obedience to the Sabbath to go to heaven, you're going to hell. <laughs> you got to be trusting. See, I'm a grace guy, but I believe in works. I would believe in his works. 
Right. Here's what He's done for me. He is my Sabbath rest. Read it. Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that there's a rest that remains. Got a question. Did the children of Israel obey the Sabbath when they were in the wilderness? Yes, for 40 years. But they did not enter His rest, even though they obeyed the rest. They didn't enter in because there's a rest that they didn't understand. It's, see, they understood the text. They didn't understand the truth. They obeyed the text, but missed the truth of the Sabbath. His name was Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. Oh, they had knowledge, good knowledge, and it led them to self-righteousness, which is death. Do you want to just go back real quick? <laughs> Colossians 2.14, how far did he take it away? Oh, that's what I was reading it. Thank you, honey. I asked the Holy Spirit when it says that he... And go, go up, put, is it on the board? It's on the board. Go ahead. Can you read that, Alan? Having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I asked the Holy Spirit a question. How far did he take it out of the way? That's when he led me to Joshua 3.16. All the way back to Adam. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what was contrary to us? He removed all the law. Am I saying we practice lawlessness? No, because there's laws of the new covenant. All the laws, the Bible even calls all the laws of the Old Covenant laws of the flesh. All the laws of the New Covenant, the five, are laws of the Spirit. The Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus. So there's a law of the Spirit of life. There's the law of righteousness is, and it goes on and on and on. So you've got those. Any questions, comments, input? Please, I love questions, comments, inputs. But we'll be prepared for a long answer. No, just uh, going back to uh, 1 Corinthians 11 where you mentioned yes. uh, communion. When we take communion. We're supposed to be thinking about Jesus. Uh, what did Paul mean by exam let a man examine himself? In 1 Corinthians what? 11. Chapter 11, 11. verse 23 through 27. Did I... Bring that up? No. Oh. You talked about uh, when we do communion. Okay. We're supposed to think about Jesus. Okay. It says consider the body. When, when a person takes uh, communion unworthily, what happens to him? They die. Get sick. What is the result of the law? What's the ministry of the law? Death. And disease. What entered the world the moment the law was broken? Death and disease. When you take communion under the law, you take it unworthily. Examine yourself. Are you still living under the law? If you are, you're subject to death or disease. You're not living under the promises. When you take it worthily, you're taking according to the body of Christ. Did the body of Christ pay the price for sickness? Yes, it did. <coughs> does it pay the price for death? Yes, it does. You will never experience death in Christ. You will just step into glory. Examine yourself. Are you still under the law? That's why the scripture says in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10, it's, a, it's impossible for someone who has been exposed and made known the glory and goodness of God to go back under the law for repentance. There's no more repentance. Why? Jesus is the final sacrifice. Even if you could go under the law, there's no sacrifice for sin anymore. That system is over. He's the I guess last. we're taught though to repent, you know, that's the whole thing. And I think there's a certain level of honoring God when we say we're sorry yes. for a certain thing. Yes. And so I think when I look at that uh, communion, when we examine ourselves, that uh, it's not that we get saved over and over, but if there's something, if there's strife in our life, if we have anger or things that are against somebody, absolutely. I think we need to clear that up we before we take the element. Absolutely. It's so called forgiveness. It's not forgiveness. It's just, you know... It's forgiveness on your part. When you're, you're, Most people repent but never receive forgiveness. Right. And See, so, that's the other half of repenting. That's, to me, I've always understood it, that I'm just... I'm, 
we're already clean. Yes. He's already cleaned us. Yes. But because we've blown it, we're just at agreeing and acknowledging God that I want to clear this up before I take this sacrifice of Christ. Very good. That that's the way I've always very good. That. So but it's that's not, not that, always taught that way. No, but see, that, and that's but see, it's not. I never looked at it as being the law, like you just suggested. Yeah. So that adds to what. Yes. I it, it helps in my uh, loss of words right now. But, but that's the way I look. Yes, I know. I was I was actually a Methodist minister for a year. I couldn't take it no more. So, sorry for a whole year. And uh, I bet they fired you. No, I voluntarily removed myself. But uh, I look at things like that as that's my love response. Yeah, it's a personal thing yes. with me. It, it's not a group thing. It's me acknowledging something before my God. One of, one of the things that we've had a problem with, or what is promoted in churchdom, is come up and get right with God. You can't. You, there's nothing you can do. No. There's no altar call, no prayer. You can't get... Jesus has made us our belief in what He's done. So I believe the act of repenting is change. The word repenting is to change the way you think. So the moment we begin to change the way we think about ourselves in the view of His opinion is when we begin to have victory over those problems that kept us falling all the time. I'm a diabetic. Until I change the way I think about Bluebell, <laughs> now I'm just putting it simple out there. I like that Bluebell. You know what I'm saying? That homemade vanilla, man, you put jelly on that sucker, that's good. You know what I'm saying? Pick your flavor, I don't care. It's all good, okay? But the, i got to change the way I think about that or it will always affect me until I change the way I think. Repenting is not feeling sorry. It's changing the, your mindset about who you are and what affects you in your life. Because if you're just sorry, you're going to be sorry again. And again, and again, and again. True repentance is changing the way. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by, by the renewing of our mind. And that renewing has to be according to the truth, not the text, but the truth that's found in Scripture. The truest thing about us is what God says about us. Like, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Correct. So the more you see yourself the way God sees That's you, right. the more you're going to act. That's like right. That. Yeah, so a man thinks in I asked this question all the way from northern Minnesota to Fongaray, Australia, uh, New Zealand. Uh, how many people sin are saved by grace? You know how many hands go up? Everybody's. You know why? They're told that. I said, put your hands down, you brood of vipers. <laughs> You're not a sinner saved by grace. You were no, a we sinner. Know two that never that's saved by grace. Now you're a saint that's got a sin problem. Stop it. Yeah. Your nature's changed. Being born from above, we try never to say the word born again. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 says you once were. Yeah, once were. Saved you're by, no longer. Uh, we were by nature children of wrath right. and disobedience. But our nature's changed. When you get born from above, your nature's changed. 1 Peter one twenty three says that when you're born from above, you have an incorruptible seed. That word seed is the word sperma in the in the Greek. It literally means the DNA. The the very you're, you're not divinity. You're not divine. You're not God, but you are identified with. See, when Adam he was created in the image and the likeness, and when he failed, that means he had, man was created with the spirit of God, mm -hmm. but he lost the spirit. He lost the the likeness, but he kept the image. And the spirit of man, so the spirit of Adam came into him. And all Christianity is about is getting back, being born again. See, most people think salvation is about adding Jesus to your Adamic nature and making your life better. That's not the gospel. The gospel is about you dying to your Adamic nature and receiving God's new nature, the spirit. That's what it means by judging the ungodly. The word ungodly means unlike God. What makes us like God? His spirit. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. Calls out Abba Father, not Abba God. Good stuff. Oh yeah, it's inside. God, see, <laughs> most people believe it's called the, the the doctrine of separation. That God is out there. <clears throat> I'll show you how this works real quick. How many people in the church say God inhabits the praises of people? So we have a worship service. That's old covenant. God doesn't inhabit the praises of His people. He inhabits His people now. 
See, in the old covenant, he was on the outside. On the new covenant, he's on the inside. Right. But we have this doctrine of separation. Like we, he's up there and we're down. No, everywhere. I am the walking manifestation of the Ark of the Covenant, <coughs> of the new covenant. The old covenant can only be one place at one time. Right. But look at every one of us. It's a walking yeah. manifestation of the presence of God. We just don't let him out. We don't know it. We don't know it. Just think what the world would be like. If we knew who we are. Mm, praise God. But the reason that the Arab nations have always been after the Jews is because it's called the, the Luciferian doctrine. The, 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 the four principles and powers have always been trying to stop the Messiah. Yeah. The Jews are still believing the Messiah is coming. <clears throat> the Luciferian doctrine is still believing the Messiah is coming. But he's already come. The first time, and that's why that from the land, from the river to the sea, they want to wipe Israel off the planet to stop the Messiah from coming. So the battle is against old covenant, and they don't have any idea of new covenant. Mm. The Jews aren't saved. Mm -hmm. They're God's special people were, but He divorced them, remarried them, divorced them, and remarried them, divorced them, remarried them, remarried them because they went out of whoring. Mm. We know all those stories. Yeah. Come to the time of Jesus, His head. Hey, here I am. He knew I was coming. You don't reckon some a lot of them didn't recognize him as Messiah. The whole group of what is called the Essenes they 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 were believing in the Messiah bringing righteousness, and they were converted into Christianity. And their whole movement stopped because Jesus. Came up. That's why we don't hear any more about the Essenes or what's known as scribes in some some writings. Uh, they were believers, and, and we'll, we'll go on that. And from that point on, there's that this new covenant. And there are a large group of Jews at the very beginning of the church that were the believers. Mm -hmm. They were the beginning. Yeah, this, 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 is, a, this is a Jewish book, Jewish author. Yeah. You know, everything in here is Jewish. And it didn't start have, with America. If you don't understand the Jewish yeah, culture is, back in the time of Christ, you yeah. really miss a lot. Because yeah. actually, in the yeah. whole New Testament, there is so much wedding talk, you have no idea. So much wedding yeah. talk. And really, there, there's so much that, because we're old covenant mindset people, like, remember, everything has to go through the cross. Everything. Including the Lord's Prayer. Yep, yeah, I'm going to do it. You're gonna, it's going to hurt you. Everything in the Lord's Prayer is an Old Covenant prayer. Conditional. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. I thought our forgiveness was based on Calvary, not conditional upon our forgiving people. Lead us not to temptation. Do you realize in the book of James it says God cannot tempt you? Yes. Then I, why are we praying for Him not to... God, please don't do what you can't do. Mm -hmm. It's Old Covenant. It's not even the Lord's Prayer. It's the prayer Jesus gave the disciples while they were on the left side of the cross. And right before the right side of the cross showed up, He said, hey, the, got the twelve together and said, hey, there's going to be a day and I'm not going to be with you in that day. And in that day, pray this way. Whatever you ask the Father, ask in my name. Does that sound different? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He told them to pray once under the old covenant, and then again prepared them for the new covenant. But that wasn't to be a ritual prayer. That was a, a, a model to pray by. Under the old covenant. Under the old covenant. Under the old covenant. Exactly. Every, give us this day our daily bread. Are the promises of God yes and amen? Mm -hmm. It's everything that pertained pertain to life and God has already been given to us. Mm -hmm. Why we pray for day? daily bread comes from the forty years in the wilderness when they had to have their daily manna. Right. That's old covenant. <coughs> Everything in there. Yeah. Wow. Good stuff. Oh no, that hurt. That people usually get up and walk out when I start talking about that. Holy cow! Mm -hmm. But I like the barbecue. I like brisket. <laughs> I sacrifice that sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's slowly, you know, long and slow, long and slow and slow. You know, just, just rotate it. But everything in there. Now, there's good principles. There's a good guidelines in there. But everything in there is a conditional, right. circumstantial. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive those. I mean, I mean, Jesus. I mean, we're, we're going to be. Do you want to end with seventeen? John what? 17. Do you want to end with John seventeen? Oh, that'd be a good thing to end with. The Lord's prayer. Yeah, we'll, we'll show you the. You want to see the real Lord's prayer? Yeah. Does anyone want to see the real Lord's prayer? We'll go ahead and do that. And I'll try to be quiet unless you ask <laughs> questions. 
John 17 is a real Lord's Prayer. And I want you to hear this. This is in red letters. The first part of chapter 17, he's praying to God to, for his disciples. They don't apply to us. It's specifically for the disciples that served him. Verse 20 changes. I do not pray for these alone, speaking of the ones he just prayed for. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe, who will believe, who will believe in me through their words. Here we got it right here. That's me. That they all may be one. Now, everybody, when I pause and you can see the word, you say it, all right? All right? Okay. All right. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So they can go to heaven. Is that what it says? Did I misread that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That they all may be one. One. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. The what? The view and opinion. His reality. His reality has already been given. And the glory which you have you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one. Just as we are. We are. One. See, see, in the Hebrew it's called a hod. Does anybody know the Hebrew language? Barely know the, the, the scripture in Deuteronomy says the Lord God He is one. The word one is the word ahad. It's unity amongst diversity. Is the definition for the word ahad. So in other words, there can be unity amongst our diversity. We don't have to be against one another. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is unity amongst their diversity. Okay, He is one. So as I said, Sorry. verse 23, I am them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know. Oh. Not that they can go to heaven. Why are we supposed to be at one or, and be one of the same kind? See, Adam could only marry Eve because she was of the same. And Jesus can only marry his bride if she's one of the same. Okay. That's why they took they pierced him in the side. No longer junior Greek, but we're one new man. Just like when Adam was in the garden, he took his rib, took bone of my bone. But Jesus is saying, bone of my bone. These are just like me. I can marry this one. Hmm. I can marry that church. Don't even get me started. Father, I desire... Too late for that. Yeah. <laughs> Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Well, you didn't finish 23. I didn't? No. I and them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me, Father. I desire that they also whom you have give, uh, you gave me may be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which you have given me for you love me from before the foundations of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. That is the Lord's prayer for you. So you can be at one. Not a good church attender. Not a good tither. Not a, not focused on your discipline. But in the oneness. That when you are born from above. You now have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Dwelling in you. You are like. The, ungodly means unlike God. When it comes to the scripture says. That he's going to judge the ungodly. The ones that are. What makes it's not it's real simple. You have the Spirit of God inside of you. Then you're at one with Him. Now act like it. Right. Let that man work out the salvation, work out the truth of that. 
doesn't mean do the works. It says take that and get it into your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and may your body begin to express that by the way you love people. So the world may know. I'm not saying that heaven is not your goal. That wasn't the goal of Jesus' prayer, was it? The goal of Jesus' prayer wasn't to get you to heaven. It was so the world may know. Very good. There's something to think about. I told you to mess you up. Comments, questions, input. I know I had to make someone mad. Do you ever listen to Dan Moore? No. Who's that? He's got a message very similar to yours. He's a good teacher then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just Dan Moeller? Yeah. No, I don't. Mm. Don't know him. He must have the same teacher. <laughs> Yeah. Working on your bangs. It's a whole new perspective on things. Yes. It's a, a new covenant perspective. Yes. Minus the old covenant. Right. People have accused us for. I remember a group of people in Fongare, which is down in New Zealand. The elders sat around the table. I was there for a week. And they sat around. The, we were talking. And they, they, they were like. They weren't frustrated. They were. <coughs> You're saying the same scriptures we've always said. They're just coming out different. <laughs> Taking the old covenant off. Yeah. Right. Freedom. <coughs> Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at joy-coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.